And here we see yet another score in which the C section, the section C, has uh, gets to the point where it's just really beautifully orchestrated and is very individual and unique. And that really was, I think, the point when I was reviewing the original materials where I felt, I think, that and then the, the way that the ending came back uh, re revisited the prologue. I think those were the two things that convinced me the most that this would be great for our community. And really, uh, that is being proven with these dotted semi-brev entries that uh, reach forward into Section C. I'm just really seeing a great level of creativity and ingenuity, and it's almost as if everything that happened up to that point uh, is like a warm-up and then in the cooldown of the music there is added emphasis of creativity from the orchestrator who's really on a roll by that point. <laughs> okay, so whatever the reason, <clears throat> let us take this one phrase at a time, one group at a time. So Christian, I really hope that you have been watching some of my other evaluations. I am going to touch on some points here that will be familiar to people who already have. Um, and, you know, just basically observing that dropping the uh, piano slurring onto winds and strings is not always the greatest idea. And also just, you know, slurring across the downbeat over and over and over again, you end up with no kind of emphasis on the downbeat anywhere, right? which uh, I feel actually goes against the piano score because since the piano as an instrument has a you know built-in emphasis on every note because of the hammers hitting the strings uh, there is already the connotation of of a pulse of uh, tonguing or or of um, or of a down bow or whatever on the downbeat so so I feel that interpreting that is just so important. Uh, and, and then the other thing too is that you're slurring across repeated notes. So what does that mean? Does it mean a sort of a portato or or does it mean like a legato kind of articulation? Or, uh, you know, what, what are, are you going to leave that decision to the players um, who might all interpret it slightly differently? Or are you going to figure this out in a different way that is more exact to your intentions? So, for instance, if you said, you know, P legato, right, to these repeated notes, then they would, you wouldn't even need the slur, right? So, for instance. Okay, um, having said that, though, there are a lot of other bugaboos that I, I am starting to return to here and there. And you have actually, I feel, uh, uh, addressed a lot of them. Like, for instance, holding back here on the heavy brass. Uh, while the uh, strings, excuse me, while the winds go to a mezzo forte here, uh, things like that, just things that balance better and so on. That doesn't mean I won't have anything useful to say in terms of feedback because I've got a lot. So let's start right here at the beginning. <clears throat> so here we've got A2 flutes and A2 oboes. So I'm going to see if I can talk you out of that, right? Every A2 combination is fraught with peril, okay? Uh, because each instrument, all on its own, has got a beautiful sense of individuality. And in a passage like this, where you really want to bring out that individuality, you, know, you really want the, the music to sound poetic and stirring, you're working against the, that character in the instruments by doubling them. There's absolutely no need to double them. There's, it's not like you need this to be more solid in any way, especially sitting over these beautiful Shalomo register clarinets. They don't need to be more solid, so why ah too? It doesn't mean twice the poetry. In the case of the oboes, it means half the poetry, because the oboe players have to match their, uh, their expression to one another rather than being each being very, very free right and, and spontaneous. So there's a lack of spontaneity as the players absolutely match what they're doing. So it almost sounds trumpet-like. And then in terms of the flutes, um, what happens is uh, you don't get twice the weight, but you do get twice the sound of the breath. 
right? So that's something that is a phenomenon that I'm noticing more and more in A2, A3, A4 flute playing is that you, you know, that the sound of the breath starts to multiply with more players. So you get this sort of very sort of fuffy sort of a kind of a tone up there. So, I mean, if that is what you want, if you have educated yourself in those subtleties and that is what you want there, then I won't dispute it just to say that it is less poetic and sort of more incidental. This is really lovely, bringing in the piccolo on top and also keeping its dynamic down a little bit, right? If everybody is going crescendo into, say, maybe about a mezzo piano, then it is great to bring this back down. I think that you could crescendo here as well in the bassoons and the clarinets. This is lovely right in here, this horn scoring. I think that this works really, really well. I, I doubt that you're going to get a piano uh, up, a, a piano or mezzo piano dynamic up here on this high A though. Uh, that That is going to really kind of blaze out. You might want this top line to be covered by uh, like pianissimo first trumpet, right? And then that would, I think that that would blend really, really well. All right, and okay, so so here you've got this line coming up here, and then this sort of response by your your paired first and second horns. So I I'm 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 cool with that. I think that this is all right. So like uh, having these two players work together, even though the first excuse me, even though the third is more of a secondary high player, it's really better for the first and the second in this instance to um, to play these thirds and to be perfectly beautiful and subtle and perfect in intonation. However, why does this need to be A2, right? Why couldn't this have just been the third horn player or even the fourth horn player since this is kind of a lower horn part? doesn't really, once again, I think it's unnecessary that you know, a lot of these doublings, um, uh, like in right, right here, you have A2 bassoons like approaching, you know, sort of like lower tenor register. I mean, it's, it's perfectly fine. It's not going to sound wrong or anything. Uh, here, the bassoons are doubling the cellos, but this first note isn't, right? Um, so here you say sultasto. So it's sultasto all the way through. So is it sultasto all the way through this entire piece? Or is it just sultasto right here? In that case, you know, here you would just you could just say norm or ord or some other kind of a thing, right? So just to sort of cancel the sultasto. But I mean I'm assuming you know, I don't see any norm anywhere. So I'm so the way that you have scored it it looks as if you uh, want the entire, you know, the strings to be sultasto for the entire orchestration, in which case I would say sempre, right? If you really want this to uh, go on and on and on, I would say sultasto sempre. Okay. But that doesn't, like, the way that you have got it scored here, the copyist is going to assume, or the editor is going to assume that the whole sultasto stuff ended with the tremolo. So they're probably, you know, because of the lack of sultasto in the cellos and the basses. So they're probably going to mark uh, just like ord or norm right here. Okay. Um, now, uh, this is kind of cool. I, uh, the thing about it is, though, piano crescendo... And then this comes in at mezzo forte. So do you really want your oboes to... I mean, just the way that you have it scored, the oboes are going to get a little overwhelmed by the clarinets here. Crescendo to mezzo forte, I think. You would, you would need to mention where this was going. And then here you're saying crescendo and diminuendo, which are left over from the piano part, but crescendo to what? What's the destination? How big do you get? And diminuendo, how far does it get? Do you get back down to piano or pianissimo or whatever? I think that there's got to be another... <laughs> there's going to have to be another 12 common, sc common scoring errors thing and just talking about how just little, little 
signs like this, little dynamic signs that mean a lot to the piano player, don't make a whole lot of sense and aren't necessarily general things to be dropping into a uh, into an orchestral score without further elucidation, without further clarification, right? I think you just really do need to clarify what, what do you mean by crescendo and diminuendo? Where are you going, right? Why isn't everybody going along with that? Why are some instruments not going crescendo? Did you forget to put them in, right? You're, you're setting all of these traps and all of these quandaries for future editors of your work. So solve those problems now. Um, I would say right in here, like these, the, the, you know, the mezzo forte dynamic on the horns right here is a little overpowering, but you know, the way that you scored it, like if you listen to the mock-up, it doesn't actually sound all that bad. It's just, you know, and, and you have got a little bit of separation, right? Uh, in, in some parts, not all, right? This is really kind of covering, uh, you know, this, this area right in here between the uh, between the upper strings and the violas, right? But it it will still have a tendency. Like I, I, I mean, I see why you are why you want so much to double this, but you don't need to go a two, right? With just a single horn player, you get a blend. With a two, uh, with a two horns here, then the violas are just accompanying the horns and and fattening up their texture a little bit. This is all really good right in here. I like this. Okay, this is very nice. Um, uh, all the same, you are sort of changing the context of the harmony in the way that you're voicing the chords, and I, I'm not so sure that that's exactly what what Barvinsky wanted, right? I think he wanted a subtler harmonic approach to the to this descent here, this harmonic descent, right? Um, as it is, it's sort of it's a little maybe a little too rock, early Rachmaninoff for for I think what he was aiming at. I mean, you have to think that this was, Barvinsky scored this in 1908, right? And so his head was probably full of things like Sweet Bergamask and um, some other like late romantic pointing towards Impressionist kinds of works. And I think that's reflected in this a lot. So just be careful about the way that you, you know, the way that you're working out the bass and the context of the harmony and everything else. I don't feel... I mean, that is implied in the harmony, but it isn't realized. And the implication is what makes things impressionistic rather than the realization of them, right? So you might want to rethink the harmony here if you have this performed. Okay, so now let's, yeah, this is cool little roll here. Now let's go on to this next section right here. And we'll just think of it all as one one big thing with, uh, with B, all right? <clears throat> so just looking at the scoring, We've got octave oboes. It's really nice to see something that is octave oboes with both instruments strong and contributing to the uh, to the texture. I like this sort of leap up here in the viola, sort of kind of taking and, and second violins sort of working together with the interpretation of the of the figuration, right, and the. Um, you're, you're, really, you're kind of delaying the entrance of the of the middle voice right in here, but that's fine. It's, it's, it's a it's a nice little touch, right? And then from there on, it's those elements are solidly in the sound picture, right? Um, you, aside from a little bit of playing around here in the clarinets, so that's that all works good. But I'm less convinced by this. I feel this drags down the. Um, the sort of the leaping quality, right? So here we're leaping upwards and we're jumping up into these other instruments and we're fluttering around and, but then like, then you have these, this extra beat in here at the bottom of the, con you know, the contrast and it's just like, Arr, Arr. And, and I just feel that it, we lose the sense of leaping upwards, right? And do you really want to go da, da, and not da, da, right? To, to connect with this? I mean, you, you sort of, you know, you've already got this low boom right in here. So it, it's just really, it's a little strange the way that this is scored, right? It's just that uh, it's a little inexact, right? It puts a lot of weight on the downbeat and the, um, 
you know, when you consider that you are trying to sound delicate here, right? We are, that's, this is removing some of that delicacy. So you've got the, the unison of the pizzicato and the tuba, that works really, really well. But the contrabassoon coming in on the same beat early, and then, you know, and then with this added stuff, I just feel that the, the weight, you end up with a lot of unnecessary, unnecessary in my, in my opinion, weight in the in the base all right so <clears throat> this is lovely right in here the way the uh the trumpets emerge and take over for the uh for the oboes without essentially a change in the in the strings be careful though about how much this pushes into you know and possibly over the sound of the uh, of the strings here because see the problem here is that you are saying piano crescendo on a high a in a c trumpet so like uh, essentially sort of mezzo piano and i would say like the softest dynamic you're going to get from this high a is mezzo forte you know i mean except that unless with a really good player but like it's painful it's kind of hard to control notes up that high um, on, you know, like above the staff, like you sort of lose subtlety, you lose nuance, you lose the ability to, to really get things soft in a way that, you know, doesn't hurt the lips and so on. So, yeah, I just really watch out what you're asking here, right? I mean, do you even need that upper octave, right? But I mean, it's cool the way you bring it in here, but there's no need to go to A2, you know, well, I mean, I guess A2 would match the kind of more trumpet-like sound of the of the first trumpet there, but uh, I'm just I'm not totally sold on this. I think it could I think it could be made to work, but I really love this. Da da da. Then the thirds with the with the going to oboe and octaves here. I just feel that right here you need a little bit more support for the oboes because the the trumpets will have a tendency to shout over them. If everybody is at the same dynamic, right? Once again, you know you're scoring brass parts in very close proximity to string and wind parts. So what do you have to do? You have to bring them down a little bit or control them in some way. This is very cool. These little um, this, these portato uh, pianissimo horns. This is exactly right, right? In terms of balancing with the rest of the orchestra, and they create some they create a sense of of intrigue. Right, and this is really, really lovely right in here. And I like the clarinets; they do not have to be marked up to mezzo piano. They will work fine. Like marking them up to mezzo piano means that they dominate the middle voice right in here, and you lose some of the, some of the uniqueness, some of the beauty of the strings right in here. Okay, <clears throat> and I really like the, um, I like the staccato, uh, the mezzo staccato right in here. I think that that's very, very cool. I think that's perfect. It's exactly what's needed there in the flutes. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's a bit of a throwaway these lower notes, right? When the when the flutes get lower and lower, but I'll I'll you know I'll I would say that's fine. You know, I don't know if like see I don't know if it really does anything to have longer notes here where they become invisible, especially because of the horns down there, right? But you, know, you might just be able to just end on mezzo staccato with an with an eighth note on that same pitch, right? And then just move on, just you know the same way that you do here, just ending, ending without having a longer note. Now here, don't do this. Uh, you know, just end your mezzo staccato um, <clears throat> slur right here, and then tongue this. Okay, seriously, you'll thank me for it. And the same thing here. This should all be tongued on the downbeat especially going into this mezzo forte and having to compete with with the brass and the brass should also not be slurred across the downbeat here. Yeah, just fact like I would really really love it if people instinctively didn't slur across the downbeat and then really thought about whether or not that they wanted to do it and then did it when it was the right thing to do rather than just having one big old honking slur that just covered everything, right? I just really feel I feel like this goes against the instincts, right? It's like, I'm, I, it, and that's what that's what sort of screams out to me is like, oh well, you know, that worked for the piano. I'll just put it onto the string and the wind parts, right? So like, the instinct should be throw away the piano slurs, and then restart 
and think about how things work the best, right? You know, do you really want to slur repeated notes, right? Okay. Uh, you know, what do you know what, you know, are, are you like, the thing is like when it happens here and there, it's, it's, it can be an intriguing effect, but when it happens constantly over and over and over again, it says to me that you're not thinking about it, right? Okay. Okay, so, um, yeah, that's, that's why I keep coming back to this. So apologies, I'm not, I don't mean to be scolding to anybody or everybody, <laughs> but I just, you know, it's sort of, I'm just seeing it so many times that I'm thinking, well, this has to, I have to make a 12 more common scoring errors. This has got to be one of them, right? But I mean, I already mentioned it in one of them, but it didn't seem like the message got through. Okay, all right, so the same thing like right here, like you are crescendoing into this. We are right at the beginning. Don't you need a downbow here? Right. All right. So, and th this is really, really cool, right in here. I lo I love what you're doing in here with the with the just increased focus of patterning, a really lovely scoring in the brass. Uh, I love this low soft A down here in the tuba. I like these rolls. I think everything is working great, and especially I love the the way that you are controlling, like you're keeping the brass in the background here and just letting the letting the trumpet speak out a little bit here. I think that's hugely effective. This is really like, this is the apex and you're just doing it great. And then and that just continues on. My only possible beef with it is that like, you know, and you're gonna hate this, right? Like, cause you hit the sweet spot here and, and it, you know, it is all working great. So what if you just suddenly dropped like pull the bottom out a little bit so that there was a contrast of dynamic or contrast of texture, some other kind of thing that just brought everything down. And then this could beautifully emerge from that at even an even softer dynamic breathing into it, right? So, you know, see, that's my instinct here um, is just, is just is to have rather than just maintaining it, having it continue on like the first two bars of B are striking. They're they're wonderfully effective, very very um, well done, and you know just feel that like that's the best part in terms of all of your calculations and everything else. Really really nicely done. Okay, but you know it's like sh how long can you keep that going? Right? Um, maybe maybe just drop everything down a dynamic degree, right? And then drop it down again. I would say you could just extremely, extremely submerge what's going on, right? So if we look at the original dynamics, I keep jumping back and forth between these pages, right? So we have mezzo, mezzo forte here, right? And then piano and, and the other elements and so on. So what if we just suddenly went or just not suddenly, what if we just went to like a diminuendo to piano as a contrast, right? And drop the brass to pianissimo, right? And then drop down to triple P and double P, right? So pianissimo here, piano pianissimo in the brass, and then allowed the lines in the bass clarinet and clarinet to emerge at a, at a beautiful piano, uh, you know, kind of a sound like this this of course starting off the bar at pianissimo and then coming emerging out uh at piano right and then i think that it would just glow and just like just emotionally you would completely get the idea here of like of yearning right that's what it's all about right barbinski is yearning for his fields and blue skies right he just he's he is really saying something deep here Right, and so, so maybe the answer to that is to not revel so much in the strength and the power and the beauty of what you've done here, but draw it in, and then allow this to take flight, just beautifully. Right, and then here, this is so lovely that the the um, muted uh, muted horns, but once again, pianissimo. Try that out, muted horns, pianissimo. And then this emerges beautifully from there, all right? And I think that that all works great. I don't, I'm not so sure that the strings need to be a pianissimo here. I think that everything could be piano-ish, right? Just as so long as the, you keep the, 
if you keep this um, this wandering phrase in strong registers and you support it well. I'm not see. I'm not so convinced by uh, violins, second violins, reaching upwards. Like for instance, I don't feel that there is enough of a phrase reaching upwards from the bottom like the way that there was here, right? And having any continuity, it seems to start here, which I feel is a shame because like it would be better to start this and then feel a definite upwards motion of a really definable, easy to distinguish um, line reaching upwards and then crossing over into the flutes in a way that handed off or or um, dovetailed into the um, the that next line, right? Yeah, and and it, it's interesting that you you basically bridge over like this was one of the concerns that I had in my evaluation criteria. You bridge over into the next section, and I'm not exactly sure how effective that is because I think we lose the feeling of like you know we lose the feeling of suspension I mean we're losing it anyways because this is so heavily um, it's so heavily orchestrated rather than the uh, than the melody allowed to just you know take flight and and not to have much behind it but a cushion right so you're you're sort of orchestrating the the cushion which is lovely and I, and I, and I see the logic by of going down here to pianissimo and the pizzicato and everything else but it really does it also does um, punctuate it and add a lot of texture and so on. In fact, you know, like if you want something to be pianissimo, it should be the harp, right? <laughs> you know, so, so I mean, I, maybe I'll change my mind a little bit on that, but I still think that the horn should start pianissimo. I think that there should be a definite uh, rising of that theme. It should be easy to hear and there should be a handoff to the flutes that isn't just a jolting change of timbre. Right, it's like it's just a sort of a. It doesn't feel like it follows. Like, hey, you know, the second violins are doing something. Oh wow, now there's something beautiful happening in the flutes. You don't you don't think so much here. Oh, this beautiful line starts and it trades over to the flutes. Right, and once again, I don't think there's any need for a two here, especially here, and here. I think individual, yeah, and and that it's just totally unnecessary. Trust your players. You don't need two clarinets here. Two clarinets have a phased sound, right? So just really, just go easy on the A2, would you? And especially here, like where you want everything to be incredibly subtle. Okay, so now we're getting to C, and here's where I just, once again, I feel like, you know, here you're taking the less is more approach, and I feel that it's just beautifully done. You do not need to say LV with a harp. Just score how long you want the pitches to last. If you want this to last, uh, you know, two beats or something or three beats, then then score that. And then this was, you know, like this is so unnecessary. The harp is going to sustain anyways. The harpist isn't going to cut off this note as they move to the next one. It is already going to happen. So however long this beat is, is however long everything is going to be allowed to sustain. Boom, 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 boom. Right? So just just write it normal. Get rid of your LV ties here. They, they completely unnecessary. Not needed in a harp scoring in this way. Okay. All right. Um, and this is all cool right in here. I, I really love like pluck, 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 pluck. Right. And then pluck, pluck, pluck. I, that's all really cool. I love the interaction here. All right. And I, it, it's right. Like you've got the right. Um, Balancing of dynamics here. That's all going to work great. I love the trills that you're throwing in. That works great. Little touches here. Pianissimo contra bassoon. I would make it staccato. And then we've got the um, bass clarinet, clarinets, and bassoons all working together here. And that is just a beautiful sound. Oh, just wonderfully reedy and dark. And then here you have the oboe and the clarinets working together with the bassoons coming in here on these soft octaves. Just wonderful, just so well done. And then they're answered by trombones and trumpets, right? And uh, and then a little bit of horn coming in. And then this stuff right in here. So, so I just, I would submit to you 
that there just needs to be a little bit more strength in your trills here, and not by adding Atu, but perhaps by doubling with um, with some strings. I know you want to go to a different color here with your trills, but you know, one way or another, you just you're going to need a little bit more strength on these trills in order for them to cope with the with the uh, brass right in here. And Atu is not the way to do it with her the clarinets. Right, just have a have a single clarinet doubled by somebody, maybe by tremolo. Right, so like that's how you could change the the nature of it. Have tremolo strings doubling the trills in your bass clarinet and then clarinet, right? And I think you'd bring that bring out that line a little bit better. Okay, but this is really wonderful scoring right in here. And I think that it, you know, it it, it erases the need for there to be a perfect replication of the of the left hand figuration, right? And just so, you know, overall I would say, with the exception of me, you know, kind of inserting my aesthetics into here and saying you should drop this and then it would set this up better and so on. I would say that you have wonderful a wonderful sense of drama in this. I think that the the sense of emotional progression is everywhere in this score. It just there are so many things leading to other things leading to other things which bring out more and more meaning in the original music. So I think it's great work. Well done, Christian, and thank you so much for all the effort that you put into this. I mean, I can just you know, I can I can see the blood, sweat, and tears underneath all the smooth phrases. <laughs> you know, I, I think you did, I think it just, you know, just great all around in many different ways. And the fact that I'm chopping it to bits and making suggestions and adding, adding corrections and things like that and giving you feedback on things does not take away from the, you know, how nicely this was done. So, in a, you know, once again, you know, another really great entry on these lower levels of support. It's not that lower levels of support have anything to do with the ability of the orchestrator at all. It's just what the orchestrator was able to contribute. And I really appreciate that. Uh, it really just, you know, just brings up the level of game, <laughs> right, in, in across all the levels of support. And that's wonderful. So people, I'm sure... Who are watching this have lots to say so write it down in the comments below give Christian some help here give him some feedback let him know what you think of this orchestration you know, what were your favorite bits you know what worked for you what what parts do you think you could help him improve that's all what the comments are for so use them thank you everybody so much for your participation in this and for your support on patreon those out there who are supporting and you Christian as well and it's especially meaningful for this year. So, you know, just very, very well taken. Well, you know, I've got so much energy right now. I think I'm going to go evaluate another score. So I hope to see you there. Bye for now.